Evan Thomas interview, take one, marker. Evan Thomas, and uh, I've worked with and for John Meacham for many years. I was an editor at Newsweek, and young John, and he's 25 years old, maybe, uh, walks into my office, and uh, is a newly hired writer at Newsweek magazine, and I instantly saw how talented he was, how, how funny he was, how bright he was, and I realized right away we'd all be working for him very soon. What I remember was that he actually remembered what was in my book. I was pretty impressed by that. He had a better memory of my book than, than I did, and I wrote it, uh, that it had an impact on him. He was also a good little suck-up uh, who knew how to flatter the guy he was talking to. Uh, but, you know, it worked. I was flattered. And, uh, and, and not just because he has great flattery skills, although he does, uh, but because he's unbelievably knowledgeable and sophisticated for a 25-year-old young man, boy, it seemed to me, uh, he just was worldly and seemed to know everything and about everybody and also had something else, this deep sense of human nature that is hard to come by. Uh, he had that from the very beginning. He was prematurely wise. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how he got that way, but he was a wise old man when he was a very young man. And you could feel that. Uh, you could hear it. You could sense it. He didn't, he wasn't, he just wasn't ponderous about it. He didn't pronounce or sound wise and Solomonic. He was funny and, and, and quick and, and modest, but you just sense that he had a kind of inner wisdom. He had a sense of humor about himself, even when he was being pompous, even when he was being a pompous young man, which of course he could be, he was funny about it. He knew that he sounded, uh, that it was kind of slightly ridiculous that this 25-year-old could quote Arthur Schlesinger on command or James Madison, or Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he, he knew that about himself. Newsweek in 1993 was still a premier publication that reached millions of Americans, that formed a lot of opinions amongst the educated class, if you will. Uh, it was a powerhouse, still. Uh, and, uh, and, and sort of thought of itself that way, it was a little arrogant in its uh, wisdom or judgment. Uh, it knew that it was a tastemaker and, and an opinion maker and acted accordingly. Uh, John had no trouble uh, walking into this world and taking it by storm as a 25-year-old. Charlie Peters has got to be the greatest talent scout ever and employed a series or hired a series of very bright young men, mostly some women, but mostly men, uh, who were precocious and had opinions long before they were entitled to have opinions. John was the latest in a string of them, uh, including Jim Fallows and David Ignatius and just a whole bunch of them. And uh, Charlie spotted John. Uh, and John came with a ready set of opinions and, and judgments, uh, but also with some modesty and, and a facile writing style and was a total success from the get-go. Generally speaking, at a big news magazine, it takes you a while to succeed. There are other people in line. John ascended instantly. I've never seen anything like it, except for with the possible exception of Walter Isaacson at time. But, but John just rose within about a, two weeks, it seemed. We made him the nation editor. We, the editors at Newsweek, made him the nation editor because we could just see he was better than everybody else, even if he was younger. It was his maturity and judgment and sense of humor and worldliness. And he was a great writer. He was a quick writer. And he just could cut to the chase, which in news magazines is important. He knew what the story was quickly, and he was articulate. And also, he had a sense of the zeitgeist. He wasn't too far to the left. He wasn't too far to the right. These news magazines tended to be somewhat middle of the road, probably left of center, but, but pretty middle of the road because they're a mass audience publication. They can't get too far out on one wing or the other. It was obvious that John Meacham was better than the rest of us. <laughs> it was anybody who opened their eyes could see that. And so it was just a matter of time before he became the managing, before he became managing editor and then finally the editor of Newsweek. Uh, it was just a question of waiting his turn and not waiting that long. I think it's fair to say he didn't arrive fully formed. I'm making him seem like Venus out of the half shell that he's, you know, down from God. No, of course, he's a kid. He still has to learn. He is still evolving. But it was in a fairly 
predictable direction in the sense that he was conservative, kind of, but again, he had this capacity to see that society evolves, and uh, he was sensitive to that, and uh, he was going to evolve with it. Uh, so he was learning. He was, you could see him like any great student of the liberal arts. He's learning all the time. He's a constant sponge soaking up personalities and facts and information and theories too. And yes, he's evolving, but it's organic. It's, it's sort of, you can see it happening before your very eyes. It's not lurching from one side to the other. He's just growing like a flower. I remember thinking he was a slightly ridiculous figure at Newsweek because people usually dress sloppily and they were a little hip. And Meacham always wore kind of a neat suit. And uh, it wasn't Brooks Brothers, but it was something like that. Uh, and a, you know, a, it was sort of his hair was carefully combed. And he had this kind of, he was in the old days, he had this slight waddle uh, as he went down the, the hallway. He would sort of waddle down. He was kind of prematurely old and an and, and, uh, uh, old-fashioned figure amongst, surrounded by a lot of people who trying to be hip. And it was incongruous. And I think he took some grief for it. I think people kind of laughed at it a little bit. But they weren't laughing when he was working on, it, when he was working on their copy. John, coming from the South, uh, was somewhat to the right of your standard uh, issue Harvard liberals. Uh, he'd gone to Swanee, the University of the South. He was more conservative than, than, than your typical Yale student. Uh, but he wasn't all that conservative. Uh, he was mostly a 19th century liberal who believed in individual rights and fairness and equality uh, and was not also not doctrinaire. I mean, to be, to be pompous about this, I would say he was a Burkean. Uh, he was a conservative who realized that change had to come, that you couldn't be stuck in place, that society was going to change, but it should do so gradually and with reverence for the traditions that came before. I mean, John was developing a worldview from many sources. I might have been one of them. He did read The Wise Men. Uh, I, could, I could talk the talk of the Cold War establishment. Uh, you know, I was a creature of the East Coast liberal establishment, and I, I suppose I exuded that. And that was a useful thing for John to hear that and absorb that. So maybe I had some impact on him. But really, John was drawing water from many wells and inspiration from a lot of different sources. And he was, that's one of his gifts, is that he can learn from many different places. I befriended him instantly because he was such a lovely guy. I mean, he was so much fun and so much fun to talk to. And, and uh, if I could help him, I wished to because uh, it was just obvious that, what a talent he was. And, uh, you know, a woman named Ann McDaniel and I certainly made it our business to try to advance John's career. It wasn't that hard. <laughs> I mean, he was so talented that it, it, we, did, we didn't see something that other people didn't see. We may have been more in his corner early on, but it was just obvious to me. John was better than everybody. I'm sure I guessed right away that he wanted to write books because he, he liked popular history. He was clearly going to be good at it. Uh, I don't remember a moment in which he said to me, I'm going to write books. I think it was just obvious that he would and that they were going to be good books. John had the misfortune to come in as the editor of Newsweek just as Newsweek was about to die. I, I don't mean literally because it still exists, but the news magazine model was breaking just as, he became, just as he got the top job. And so even John Meacham could not save Newsweek. Nobody could. The model was broken. He gave it a good shot. He really tried to produce a quality publication. He taught me a lot. I mean, he talks about m me teaching him. I, really, it's the other way around. I learned from him uh, things, lessons that I should have learned long before about being humble about what it is we do. What do I mean by that? Newsweek had kind of a snarky tone, a kind of a little bit know-it-all, we know, you don't, we're going to tell you what to know tone. And I embodied that tone. I knew, I knew how to write that way, this sort of vaguely Olympian tone. 
John taught me something about modesty, which was do not presume that the people you're writing about are a bunch of dunces. That's just not true. They're human beings. Yes, they make mistakes. Yes, they're flawed. Yes, they what they did yesterday was maybe wrong. But that doesn't mean they're terrible people or that they can't be redeemed. And don't write about them with a snotty attitude. You know, write about them in a fair and open and respectful way. You can have a little fun with it and make it lively, but don't condescend to the people you're writing about. John didn't learn that from me. I learned that from him. John is courtly and uh, has a, a polite and courtly and respectful manner that maybe a wise-ass Harvard guy like me does not have. So it is a little bit cultural, but I think it transcends culture, I really do. I think in his case, it's partly religious. Uh, I mean, it's a sense of forgiveness and, and uh, decency born of his Christian faith. Uh, but it is a little culturally, culturally different from the kind of wise-ass attitude that Easterners, Northeasterners like me were guilty of. I mean, the one reason why John works is because he's not holier than thou. He's funny and irreverent, I mean, wickedly irreverent. He can be, he can get away with saying stuff that other people just can't get away with because I think people sense in him a sense of forgiveness. So that even though he's making a wise-ass remark that's kind of borderline outrageous, people sense that he's really not that way. He's not really, in some larger sense, he's not judging them. Quite the opposite. He has a sense of the redeemable side of human nature, that people aren't, they may seem wicked, but they have a good side. And if you are patient and wait for it, the good side eventually will show. John is completely driven. John has been driven ever since I knew him. I mean, how do you think he got to be so successful? He's graceful about it. He has a sense of grace and sense of humor, but of course he's driven. How else could he do everything he's done? Most great people, it's not that easy to figure out exactly what drives them. Uh, John is driven certainly by some good things, uh, by his desire to be a good father, his desire to be a good husband, his desire to be a good friend. John has a desire to see what is good in America and to let people know it while being realistic about what's not so good in America and what has even been wicked and evil in America in the past. John knows all that, but he has a sense of, above all things, a sense of redemption and, and that people can be redeemed and that even people who have taken the wrong turn can find the light or their successors can find the light. That even if we're stuck in a dark place, there is a way out and that history shows we've done this again and again and again. John is religious. John is a faithful Christian uh, who believes in, in, in Christian dogma. And, but he, the essential message that John believes in, leaving aside theology, is that human beings are sinful. Yes, we are. But that we're not hopelessly sinful. That we can be redeemed. That but through faith and hope and charity, uh, we can get to a better place, and that we've done this all through our history, even as we've wrecked havoc and started wars and oppressed peoples and enslaved peoples and committed mayhem. Over time, the arc of history does bend upwards towards justice, and particularly in the United States of America, that's been true for all of our immense flaws and our current problems. The history of the United States is one of hope and one of progress through some dark nights, but eventually to the dawn. I am a little more cynical than John. Uh, I've tried to learn from John. I have tried to make myself more hopeful because of his message. He has taught me to be more hopeful, but uh, my natural starting place is a little darker and a little bit more cynical. I, was, I wasn't exactly wallowing in cynicism when I met John, but I was pretty cynical, and John has helped me learn not so much as a religious message, although I respect that, but just through his, own, his sense of history and his sense of human nature to be a little bit more forgiving, forbearing, and hopeful. What I remember is John finding various 
incidents in our past that reminded us not to despair and the, the ones that come to mind. He's very good on the lost cause, for instance, uh, uh, that after the Civil War, the South fastened on to this fake story, basically fake story, kind of romantic but untrue story, and it led us to a bad place, the Ku Klux Klan and Jim Crow, and it all seemed pretty grim, and yet we did get out of that. I mean, the Civil Rights Movement did happen. Uh, you know, he has that photograph of the Klan marching down Pennsylvania Avenue, thousands of people in white robes. I mean, some number of governors of the United States and senators were members of the Klan. That was a bad place in the 1920s, and yet we came out of it. You know, Brown v. Board of Education did happen. The Civil Rights Movement did happen. So I remember him talking about that and his fascination with learning more about the lost cause. Uh, so I remember that. I know we talked about McCarthyism, how what a dark night that was in the early 1950s, but how we came out of that. And so I, I was talking to him about this in the context of modern times, which seemed to many people to be pretty dark. Uh, you know, John saying, yeah, they're, they're pretty dark, but they've been dark before. John has a keen appreciation of the importance of the separation of powers. I mean, not to sound like a civics book here, but John really gets the idea that the founders understood that if you concentrate power, bad things are going to happen. If you give too much power to one party or one person or one cause, ugly things happen. But if you spread out power, if you have checks and balances, if you have different branches of government, if you have the press checking government, and all of us being checked by religion and variations on that theme, it's going to work out better for everybody because there is a natural energy towards corruption. Power corrupts, it's a cliche, but John believes that. And the genius of the founders was to spread out power and to separate power and to have checks on power. The great genius of John Adams was to look at himself and see a vain, vainglorious, ambitious person and think, hmm, I'm a leader. I need to be checked. Somebody like me, we need to have checks. We, if, if I'm in charge, that's dangerous. And John got that and gets that in a way that a lot of people don't. A lot of journalists like me are a little cynical and mostly look in terms of sort of taking pot shots at uh, authority and kind of revel in it. John is another step here, which is that, well, that's all fine. We can do that, but we really do perform this historic function of being a check on power. He's not pompous about it, but he sees, he sees his own role as a journalist. He saw his own role as being a check on power, but also be somebody shedding light uh, into dark corners, not just investigative light, but also just explaining what's going on, talking about history. You know, John writes brilliantly about religion in the third century to make us better understand how Christianity sold itself. I mean, he can do it. He can pick a century. He can, he can do it. Uh, and he would use his sense of history to remind us what the larger stakes are and, and, and to find a way out and not just be corrosively cynical or yammering away at how terrible things are, which is a lot of what the press does, but to also see a way out to see that there are, there are roads out of these difficult solutions, and we need to point them out, not in a pedantic way, but in an illuminating way. I've known uh, a couple of truly great journalists, uh, popular historians, Walter Isaacson and John Meacham. I work closely with both of them. They're both my friends. Uh, they have a superhuman capacity to work just beyond all of us. I mean, they can write books in the middle of the night. They can write books while they're, you know, juggling children and, and family obligations. They just, they're not like the rest of us. You know, that famous line from Fitzgerald, the rich are different from you and me. Meacham is different from you and me. He can just do things that I can't and that you can't and that other people just can't do. He just has a level of energy that is not normal. I don't think John sleeps much. I mean, I don't really know, but I, how could he? How do you get that much done and sleep? Also, this capacity to be on and to shift tracks. Uh, John is a, one of these great multitaskers who can shift from one subject to the next with absolute focus. 
uh, I don't know how you jump from one horse to the other as you're charging across the prairie, but, but John can do it and, and do it without complaint. I've tried to drag him into, for instance, commenting on a book I'm writing or chapters, and without missing a beat, he can enter my world and with complete acuity and complete concentration get right where I am from a standing start. Uh, I just don't know how the hell he does it. Uh, uh, it, it's not normal. It is superhuman. John reminds me of some politicians I've seen who have this natural energy. Bill Clinton drew power from adoration and from popular contact. I mean, when he came on a stage, his personality grew. When he walked into a crowd, his personality grew. He became more charming, more dominant. John is a little bit the same way. I've watched John do three events in one day, breakfast, lunch, and almost dinner and he grew in energy. Most people, the arc is down. With John, it's up. He just can draw from crowds. He can see how much they adore him. They laugh at his jokes, the same jokes over and over again, but they laugh at him, and, he, and as a result, his jokes seem fresh. I've heard, heard him say the same joke three times in one day. It just is funny and natural and irreverent and just r fresh as it was, as it always is. That's a rare thing. How many people can do that? Great politicians can do it. Great comedians can do it. Great performers can do it. John is a great politician, a great performer. He is all those things. If John wanted to run for office, God help him if he ever did, and I don't think he ever will, but he would be fantastic because he has that Bill Clinton, Clinton ability to suck energy from the people who are listening to him and not shrink but grow. People have approached him. I mean, he's certainly, people in Tennessee and elsewhere have said, hey, John, you ought to run for something, because he'd be a natural. Uh, he, he'd be a, I know, no, there's no such thing as a surefire politician, but he's got the gift, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's got the human touch, and he's got the idealism, and he's got the political skills, he can get along with people. He's a natural. All popular historians, uh, subject themselves to the scrutiny of academics who are, some of them, jealous. And also, we do different things here. Real academics are great in the archives, and they go deep, and they master the subject. Popular historians spend three or four years on a subject, and then they move on. They don't go deep. They are not great archival geniuses. I mean, there, there's a lot of overlap, for sure. But academics have reason to see themselves as being distinct, and in some ways better, than journalists and resent us a little bit for ripping them off or popularizing what they do. I get that. That's, hey, that's human nature. It's the natural order of things. The truth is, the best relate with John and, 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 and Walter Isaacson's good about this, and most of the good popular historians are very good at working with academics. John has a lot of friends. He has some, there's some jealous academics, but he makes friends in the academy. He works with them. He's respectful of them. This is true, uh, certainly working on the Jefferson Papers, and uh, he's, he's pretty good, I think, at, getting, at being smart enough to make friends with academics to, to say to them, I need you. I need your help. I need your wisdom, and I need your experience, and to draw from that and to be respectful about them and thank them and to credit them. John's natural audience is uh, people who are moderate and pretty well-educated. He's going to reach them automatically. But I hope, and I would like to believe, that he's getting outside of that bubble. Because he is so good on TV, because he can present in large audiences, I hope and I think that he can reach young people who are suspicious of establishment people like me, who think that you know we're old sort of dead white males and we're not quite dead yet, uh, or are kind of conventional retro establishment figures that John can transcend that by his charm and his wisdom and his empathy, that he can reach people who might not otherwise listen to a moderate point of view. I think his book sales suggest that he is reaching those people, and he, he, he can take on large audiences and TV and radio and so forth and podcasts, and I think reach them, and if not convert them, at least make them think twice about being dogmatic and judgmental.
When George H.W. Bush was declaring for the presidency in 1987, the cover of Newsweek was called Fighting the Wimp Factor. And uh, the, the cover story, which I edited, my name's not on it, but I edited it, uh, made Bush look wimpy. And George Bush hated that. Of course he did. Uh, it made his daughter cry. Uh, which nobody likes to see their daughter cry. And John Meacham was sort of confronted with this reality. Uh, President Bush used to refer to the ugly editors at Newsweek, meaning me and people like me. And John is so captivating that through our mutual friend Ann McDaniel, who was not an ugly editor, uh, was taken at Kennebunkport and met President Bush, and John just won him over convinced him that he was not an ugly editor, that he was actually a fair-minded, charming guy who was kind of like George H.W. Bush, and they became fast friends. I don't know how to do this in a, in a way that isn't sappy, but John Meacham is a loving person. You know, he's a, a loving husband and father and all. He's a loving friend. I feel his love. I feel his, you know, I can be kind of high mind, I feel his Christian love, but it's more than that. It's just human empathy. John is an empathetic person. You feel that. When you're in pain, I've been, John and I have been around the track a long time. We've been through a lot of tough situations, difficult stories, difficult personnel situations, difficult personal situations. I have always felt his love. When you think about it, you know, news magazines are institutions of the past. They are. But in their day, they were pretty prominent, and they're dealing with difficult situations, uh, the Monica Lewinsky scandal, wars, elections, you're on deadline, people get mad, they get upset, they get scared. And Meacham, through all of that, conveyed to me a sense of understanding and empathy and kindness and the sense of, look, we're all in this together. And it may seem dark and ugly at this moment. We're going to get through this. We're going to be, we're going to crack sardonic jokes and we're going to be anxious. But, you know, we're going to get through this because we're in it together. We're friends. How bad can it be? It can be pretty bad, but we're going to get through it.